Hi, I'm, um, I'm Jesse with, with, uh, with a Living Free Community Foods, and we happen to be here in, in um, uh, we're, we're in a suburb, we're in the Grange Hall, here in Ashland. And we're talking with Chris Hardy, who is a local family farmer. And in my understanding, Chris has, uh, Chris grows a variety of herbs, of vegetables and of seed crops. Seed crops are so very, very vital and so very important indeed. So Chris, for how long have you been farming? Um, so my granddad was a farmer in Iowa, on the in Iowa? Wisconsin, mm -hmm. Iowa uh, border. And uh, I would every summer, every summer go uh, off to help my grandmother and grandfather on their, uh, their farm where they had mm -hmm. um, many head of cattle and about every animal that we could possibly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, name off and uh, they were producing alfalfa and corn. Alfalfa and corn, okay. In Iowa. Yep, and so that, that was, that's, and then I went on to Montana uh, to, to farm there and start uh, farmer's markets uh, uh -huh. and then uh, uh, came here to the Rogue Valley. About 10 years ago I've been farming in the Rogue Valley working with the Rogue Valley Farm to School program and uh, uh, with our Rogue Valley Growers and Crafters Market, our farm, local farmers market here. Your, your, your local farmers market here. And you have to, and uh, I want to say, in just driving around this region, it is wonderfully fertile. It's intensely green. It's a very, very special place to be. So, Chris, uh, in my understanding, you were walking your land one day and you looked over the fence and you discovered something untoward, something out of the ordinary. Would, would you like to tell us a little about that? Well, actually, we were uh, looking for uh, to lease a piece of land. You wanted to lease some more land? Lease, lease a, a, a small piece of land and something that was close into the city where our, our farmers lived mm -hmm. um, that were part of our, our farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, a conversation with the landowner uh, went excellent. It was a friend of a friend and a really close friend, and he recommended that that would be a good alignment, good relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made the connection and walked his land and mm -hmm. and uh, four acre chunk of land, and it had been sitting fallow for thirty years and taken well care of, good mm -hmm. care of, and, and uh, it had full irrigation and everything, and and uh, it it felt like a good fit, like we were had the same vision. Mm -hmm and uh, walked around to the other side of the property uh, after, you know, just curious uh, what was going on with the rest of the land there. And he said, sure, we'll go, go check it out here. And he said, oh, okay, this other four acre piece right here that was just kind of bare dirt, mm -hmm. you know, there was no cover crop on it or anything. Uh -huh. And I'm like, geez, what's going on here? What's what happening Nothing. There? It's just kind of dirt there. Is somebody How's like working that? How's he says, well, yes, there's a, uh, 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 Syngenta is producing uh, genetically engineered sugar beets right there. An international conglomerate. Uh, Syngenta, yes, they're from Switzerland. They're the largest you chemical know, corporation. Here we have a small town in southern Oregon, and suddenly a multinational, a multinational sim simply appears out, out, out of nowhere, and what they start to do is to grow GMO crops just out of nowhere, without advising anyone, without any warning, um, just, uh, ju just out of nowhere, and go ahead and do it. And, and even though the law requires them to at least send out notices about this, which they never even did. Affirmative, yes. Yeah. Under the USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection okay. Service, the APHIS branch of USDA, they were required uh, uh, as a regulated biotech crop, we're required to notify any farmers in the area of within four mile distance, that's the distance that the USDA saw fit to keep the pollens isolated. Anything in that, within the four miles, they were to notify adjacent farmers. And so, of course, they did not notify us, even, even though we were producing just not more than a quarter of a mile uh, for five years on, uh, from that site that we were looking to lease additional and uh, other farmers out across the Rogue Valley indeed were growing uh, unbeknownst to them adjacent uh, this chemical corporation had set up next to them to lease land uh, to produce their genetically engineered crops which it's important to understand for seed 
because then pollen is produced and that pollen is what actually uh, adulterates uh, exactly. one seed crop. Okay, now the, the actual crop that they were growing happened to be sugar beets. Why is that vital? What's so special about the sugar beets? Why is that regulated so heavily? So why are sugar beets regulated? Um, they were deregulated and then re-regulated at some point in the process of the past several years and then fully uh, deregulated uh, uh, later in 2012. Yeah. So then you, 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 these guys can grow their sugar beets anywhere in the yeah. United States without permit. Right, but the point I'm making, sugar beets cross-pollinate with ordinary garden variety beets and with Swiss chards also, and that's the critical thing. Uh -huh. they, they totally do that, and, uh, and, and it would make your seeds, your beet and your chard, if it receives those, uh, those pollens would uh, implant that technology uh, the roundup resistant trait, or uh, in the case of corn, you would have like a BT uh, Bacillus thuringiensis uh, being made in the silk, in the stock, in the cob, the corn, the kernels, the roots, everything of the plant. So, in the cases of, of corn that are being produced here in the area, uh, that that would also threaten those that uh -huh. all that. Uh -huh. So, in other words, the vital seed crops that you're doing were fundamentally challenged. That's it. So Chris, after you made this revelation and discovery, what were your thoughts about the implications? Um, so I knew that our farm was not less than a quarter of a mile away mm -hmm. and had been saving beets and charred mm -hmm. seed for nearly five years mm -hmm. from uh, the site of where this gentleman was telling me uh, he was leasing land to the chemical company. Um, and then uh, as I, that dawned upon me thinking that there's a high likelihood because you need four mile isolation to keep your beet family mm -hmm. seed crops separate from uh, you know, other beet family, charred and beet family. Mm -hmm. Um, I looked over my shoulder and there was the Walker Elementary School, there was the John Muir uh, Middle School, there was the Ashland Middle School, these three schools that were all had gardens saving seeds right over the back of the fence where I was standing with this gentleman who was telling me this uh, about the chemical company uh, are where our kids are, uh, are in their playgrounds and they're hanging out and, and uh, I was manager of the Ashland High School Garden. Mm -hmm. At the time, we were saving chard seed, a Swiss chard, mm -hmm. and uh, rainbow chard. Mm -hmm. And the kids were excited about that because it had wintered over and it had taken a whole year to get to where we were as the, sure, as the yeah. plants were you know, getting ready to produce seeds and, and go into flower. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I just thought, well, this is not more than a quarter of a mile. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a number of blocks. It's not that far away from where the chemical company was. And so I'm checking in with my students like, okay, guys, what are we going to do about this? Because there's probably pollen uh, going to be blowing here through the air and we're going to have to either till under the chard or we're just going to have to chance and try to keep the seeds. and. What are we going to do about that? We're probably going to have to have it sent to a laboratory to have all the seeds tested. And you know, the kids, it was kind of, uh, it was, it was challenging for the kids to understand, mm -hmm. like, what are we going to do, and why is this happening to us, and why are we having to talk about like destroying, you know, our seeds? Because seeds, they they understand, are really important to the garden because we can't get another generation of plants without those seeds, and so that was a really important piece of the education in there their connection in there and of course as I, as I called the, the, the chemical company themselves within a few days uh, to find out that they use 23 different chemicals in the production of their crops, their genetically engineered crops here in Southern Oregon. This is what the manager for their production here in Southern Oregon told me and I was just like oh do I want to see the MSDS? Uh, look I you know I, I, I used to work in Iowa, you know, on the farm, and, and I know a lot of farmers there use a lot of chemicals. And, you know, I had my hands in the chemicals at some point in the soybean fields and the corn fields back in Iowa. So I, I'm no stranger to what chemicals are and what the implications of that are. And that's, you know, part of my 
story of, of like moving away from the chemicals. My grandfather, incidentally, on his farm in Iowa, did not use these chemicals. So I'm you know, so that's happy. it's deep in in my roots, and so that's when when I, I knew that something had to be done about this to protect our farmers uh, in southern Oregon. To protect, and it, it, it's not just the farmers, but community gardens. You know, and imagine, imagine kids who, who, you know, who, who have a raised bed or a community garden in, in the back of their school. Even they happen to be threatened by this. That's an amazing story, Chris. So I'm so glad that I'm so, so glad that that you, know, that you understood what the danger was, mm -hmm. and that you also stood up and were counted and got the word. Super important because seeds are the foundation to our food seeds supply. Are the and, and when we have seed packets that are coming on the internet and wherever they're shipping them all across the world, like I, I don't know, you know, I, our, our farm actually lost a thousand dollar seed contract in 2013 when I contacted the Swiss chemical company to let them know that our seed crop was about ready to produce seeds mm -hmm. for our, to fulfill our mm -hmm. seed contract to the largest cooperatively owned seed company in the United mm -hmm. States, mm -hmm. uh, uh, only to be told that Syngenta, the, the Swiss chemical mm -hmm. company, was going to be planting their sugar beets, mm -hmm. and uh, GMO sugar beets, and they would not tell us where, but they said it was affirmatively within the four mile distance that was uh, uh, recommended and that was mandated at the time it was regulated in 2011 and 2012 mm -hmm. but in 2013 it got fully deregulated late 2012 so 2013 growing season they could legally plant them wherever they want and they notified uh, they, they uh, their response was that they were going to go ahead and plant those sugar beans mm -hmm. at, at this site that was within a quarter mile distance because they had a relationship with this landowner and they just wanted to keep it like that. And of course, our, our local government is telling us, why don't you just, and the USDA, when I called the USDA to speak with them, their deputy director, he says, you know, I, I just recommend, you know, they're gonna deregulate, in 2012, he was telling me this, they're gonna deregulate the, the GMO sugar beet, the Roundup resistant sugar beet. You might as well just face it, you're just gonna have to, develop a relationship with Monsanto and Syngenta and just say, hey, let's work together on this. Where are you guys planted? And, you know, the, the, the bottom line is Mother Nature, you do not stop Mother Nature from, from doing what she does. And we've heard it from Dr. Carol Mallory Smith, who is an OSU Extension weed scientist, a specialist in this area. She says you cannot stop gene flow. Mother Nature will do her deal, you know? She will have sex, if you will, and then that will just make another generation. So where's the pollen blowing? Well, four miles is about best guess as we can, you know, is that downwind, upwind, in a canyon where, where it bottlenecks and it blows that pollen much faster? It's, it's, it's a four mile best, best guess estimate. And so that, that's why the, the threats uh, of this uh, do not, you know, the, the rules that they create to say, oh, four mile distance should be safe. Dr. Carol Mallory Smith says you cannot stop gene flow and eventually our food supply is going to be fully contaminated with every one of the canolas and the corn and the soybeans and, and uh, the, the chard and our beets, uh, table beets. All that stuff is going to be contaminated and of course Monsanto is working on new projects uh, DuPont and Dow Chemical, all these guys have new projects they're getting ready to, to roll off the line and it's going to encompass our entire food supply where pollens can be introduced to, to contaminate the, the, you know, what is not already contaminated in our food supply. What did you do to get the word out of it? Um, so initially, I, I just sent out a Facebook post that you was sent out a Facebook post. I sent out a Facebook post that got many comments and a lot of dialogue going, and uh, lots of concern in the community that this this was definitely an issue that our community, many in our community, felt like needed to be dealt with. So um, I sent out another update, but I sent it out on email to to uh, out across Southern Oregon and uh, out on Facebook mm -hmm. and. and uh, and called a meeting mm -hmm. uh, of which we had nearly 75 people from all across the region mm -hmm. show up mm -hmm. and uh, farmers, teachers, uh, mothers, parents, um, uh, 
citizens just showed up uh, to say that, that we wanted, uh, all of us wanted to do something about this. Okay. So that's when we proceeded uh, ahead with the citizens initiative to create a citizens initiative. citizens initiative to create uh, what is now was was at the time uh, at, at recently was measure one five one one nine Jackson County uh, uh, to protect family farms in the area from uh, the threats of genetically engineered crops okay. and we so we got the signatures and uh, we we uh, got nearly t uh, sixty percent more signatures than we needed to place it on the ballot and got that submitted uh, in. in early 2013 and so it was a little better than a year before uh, the citizens actually uh, showed up to, okay. to the ballot to, to make the vote of which was overwhelmingly in support of banning. The vote was overwhelmingly in support. 67% uh, okay. nearly 67% of the voters, 42,000 okay. So that voters. means that something without historical precedent has occurred here. Jackson County, in my humble understanding, happens to be the, the only county of, in all of these United States, just about, in which GMOs are banned. It's not, it, it's not GMO labeling, but you have a ban on actually growing GMO crops here. This is a world historic precedent. This has implications far beyond National Oregon, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So it actually passed. Mm -hmm. Okay. The state of Oregon reacted very strongly, in my understanding. They also passed a, 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 a certain law, and you would yep. you like to tell yeah, us about that, it? Yeah, that, that's correct. Uh, just immediately after, <laughs> immediately after, immediately after we submitted our signatures uh, to to uh, the county mm -hmm. uh, to have it placed on the May 2014 ballot, um, an organization, a political action committee called Oregonians for Food and Shelter, mm -hmm. who has a board of directors that are stacked with Monsanto. Mm -hmm. Uh, Syngenta, other chemical corporations um, that are serve on the board uh, that is out of, uh, I believe it's in Salem, Oregon. Um, this organization uh, helped draft a, a, a bill uh, to be put forward to legislation that would es essentially stop uh, all uh, banning of genetically engineered crops across the state. In, in all local in all efforts at, it, across the world. It, it would stop local efforts, so the only way it could be done would, would, would have to be on, on, you know, on a statewide level. It would, yeah, it would take the power of the local, uh, municipal and local areas and place the power of deciding take whether you're growing genetically people, engineered. And, and raising it and putting it on. Send on, it on, to Salem. Send it to, to, which is an old old story because they're also planning to do much, much the same thing on a national level too. You know, to, to, to uh, 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 you know to take away the power of states to you know to, to label or to ban GMOs mm -hmm. and to make that and, and, and to take that local initiative or that possibility away and uh, so that you can only deal with this on a national level. That's that's correct. But Jackson County was offered a grace mm -hmm. uh, by the legislature who. Uh, writ in, wrote into the bill to uh, have an exception, and the exception was Jackson County. The reason why Jackson County was exempted from this, this legislation, which was dubbed the Monsanto Protection Act of Oregon, because they, uh, you know, along with Alec and the Koch brothers, gave large sums of money to not only the politicians who were involved in passing this legislation, uh, but were also giving large sums of money to other lobbying groups such as the Oregon Farm Bureau who was instrumental in the passage of this, this, this bill. Uh, but that exempted Jackson County, uh, but left our neighbor Josephine County, who is an integral part to our bioregion here really? of Josephine County, uh, uh, was, was not exempted. So, uh, but shortly thereafter, uh, Josephine County uh, got the, the necessary, nearly double the numbers of necessary signatures to place that on the the May ballot. On the ballot, right along with Jackson County, yeah, yeah. Uh, to to go ahead and, and let the citizens speak yeah. uh, how they felt um, mm -hmm. agriculture uh, needed to to proceed ahead, and of course the food system as we now understand how important oh. that that you know in, having these patented pollens. Mm -hmm. Uh, flying around mm -hmm. in, into our community gardens where uh, people save seeds. You know, how many seed exchanges and seed mm -hmm. gatherings and seed banks I know in the area that uh, have charred and beet seeds mm -hmm. in there, unbeknownst to 
us again at the time in early 2012 that the chemical company was set up right next door to out across the entire Rogue Valley. Uh, mm -hmm. When I spoke to Syngenta, mm -hmm. they said they had nearly 40 sites from Ashland all the way to Grants Pass, which encompasses virtually the entirety of the Rogue sites. Valley. That's amazing, the entire valley. And, and, and you know, we, we live in a somewhat narrow geographical it valley. It was all done covertly. It was all done see, without putting the word out to anyone. It was only after the fact that people started finding out. Dozens of farmers. Uh, the extent of this is phenomenal. Indeed, we had uh, over 170 farms have signed the Jackson County uh, ballot measure alone in support, and we had uh, over 200 farms out across Josephine and Jackson County uh, that, that saw genetically engineered crops as a threat directly to uh, their bottom line and the threat to their existence as family farms. So that was kind of a clear, uh, a clear statement uh, when when the farmers started showing up, saying this is not something that. Right. Like. You know, I just want to point out. In olden times, or not so olden times, an integral part of every organic farm was not just to harvest the veggie, but to save seed. You mm -hmm. save your local seed. That's an integral part that's been going on for millennia. Mm -hmm. And here, this vital function of organic farming is being threatened at its roots. Now, that's an outrageous thing. Being threatened at its roots from a multinational company based in um, in uh, Switzerland, of all places, from Switzerland to Ashland, Oregon. Where they are banned to produce this technology in their own country. And Switzerland. To, so they have to do it elsewhere. Switzerland is one of dozens of, of regions the across the world that have banned genetically engineered crops. And there they, they leave Switzerland, they come here uh, to southern Oregon and, uh, and even uh, other parts of the country where they're, they're producing this technology. That's an amazing thing. So, uh, Chris, I just want to thank you. It's been uh, very encouraging speaking with you indeed. And once again, it emphasized that at the grassroots, at the local level, we have more power, energy, cre and, and a creativity than we happen to know. So, very good. It, uh, it, it's been a privilege and pleasure indeed speaking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse.